Okay, so hello everyone, and thank you for joining the second of eight sessions in our global conversation series. Today we're focusing on Africa, and the discussion points are one that I'm very passionate about, conservation, community, and sustainability. Joining us are three incredible women at the forefront of these topics. Our conversation will cover the course of the crisis from the impact of, of a complete global shutdown to an understanding how each of their organizations have been resilient through it all. Of course, we are very eager to hear what's on the horizon now that borders are reopening. I can truly think of no better place to be naturally socially distant than out in the bush safari. I'm so pleased to introduce our guest panelists, starting with Dr. Andrea Ferry, who's joining us from Cape Town, where she's been with the Singita family for 13 years. The past seven, she's been part of their conservation team, driving the One Planet Living Framework. This is an initiative focused on behavior change to impact sustainability. Last October, I had the pleasure of staying at Singita's newest lodge, Quintondo, which is in Rwanda a lodge that was overseen by Andrea and is a testament to Singita's commitment to reduce their ecological footprint and to improve the well-being of staff, guests, and neighboring communities. Also joining us from Cape Town is Mindy Roberts. She's director and CMO of Time and Tide. Her career has taken her from Global Capitals to the Zambian National Park. Now at Time and Tide, her business acumen and passion for conservation through luxury safari tourism are well-matched. I love her mantra, be brave enough to be who you really are. I can't wait to explore Zambia and Madagascar alongside Mindy in the future. Anna Rathman is based in New York City as director of the Great Plains Foundation, which is the charitable arm of Great Plains Conservation. I was so lucky to stay at their camps in Botswana in the spring of 2018 and in Kenya just last October. I've been impressed by their mission to find the right formula of conservation, community, and commerce that can make a lasting sustainable difference to the world's iconic wildlife and wilderness. If you've ever had the opportunity to watch one of Derek and Beverly Jobert's documentaries for Nat Geo, you will see the same passion throughout the Great Plains camps. So ladies, thank you for making time in your schedules to join us. I'd like to start by asking all of you the same question. Collectively, your companies operate in South Africa, Botswana, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, and Madagascar. So once the lockdowns were announced and borders began to close, how were each of you, members of your staff, or your partners impacted? And Andrea, maybe you'd like to go first. Well, thanks, Jolina. Thanks for the introduction, and hi um, to everyone. Um, who might be watching. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when it first happened, we obviously were very focused on making sure the guests that we had in our, our various lodges made at home safely and well. And then after that, um, a lot of staff also left to go and spend time with their families, leaving a skeleton staff managing our lodges to make sure that they were secure, maintained, um, and also to keep some ears and eyes on the ground in our concessions. Uh, because obviously with, without lots of guests and lots of staff around, uh, those areas are more um, vulnerable to poaching incursions. So yeah, luckily we, we um, uh, conservation uh, functions were considered an essential service and those teams stayed on the ground. Okay. And what about um, at Time and Tide and also in, with Singit, uh, with, uh, sorry, with Great Plains? Yeah, so we've got about 550 employees across Zambia and Madagascar, and then we've also got an office here in Cape Town. Um, most of our guys are, and, and women are locals, so luckily they were sort of already in their local homes, so to speak. In Zambia, it's a bit easier because everyone sort of lives close to where the lodges are, and, and like um, Singita, we had a skeleton staff that stayed on. Madagascar was a little more difficult. You know, we're an island off the coast of Madagascar. The only way to get there is by helicopter. So we really had to be quite clever about how we kept people on or were trying to get them back to the mainland and back to their families. Um, so that was a little bit more challenging. Um, and our helicopter pilot actually was in Cape Town, luckily with his wife and child and ended up getting stuck here for six months and couldn't get back home to Madagascar. So it kind of happened both ways. And Anna? 
Yeah, um, I, I'll echo the, the comments from, from my previous two panelists. Um, we at Great Plains experienced much the same, really making the, um, the health and safety of our guests, first and foremost, making sure that they were able to get home safely to their loved ones, um, and, and looking to our staff and making sure that they were healthy, they were safe. Um, a couple of things that I would add to it is, um, I think uh, it was mentioned earlier, but as the areas cleared out and the tourism operations ceased, we wanted to make sure that there were still eyes and ears in the concessions where we operate and in the conserved areas. And so appealing to our staff and asking them if they're willing to pivot their job roles into more of a wildlife monitoring, wildlife protection role was something that was really critical. And, and we were so honored and humbled um, that everyone took up that, that opportunity, so. That's actually a great segue because, you know, globally we were all impacted, you know, one way or another, our personal and professional lives, you know, went into some form of lockdown. Um, maybe you can help us understand a little bit more what a total cessation of travel has meant, you know, not just for the companies and foundation, but the trickle down effect towards communities, wildlife and conservation projects. And I'll let you, since Anna, you started with that, you know, maybe take that and dive a little bit deeper and then the other ladies can chime in. Yeah, well, one of the things that I, um, I so appreciate about this conversation today is the opportunity to talk about that and to shine a light on the important role that tourism plays and all of our companies play in these conservation efforts. And it's um, in addition to funding, a lot of conservation efforts around the world, Africa included, are funded through tourism operations. But then there's also these kinds of auxiliary activities, um, like I mentioned earlier, of just the physical presence of having a vibrant tourism operation there where you have eyes and ears um, in the areas, checking on the animals multiple times a day. Um, so when, when that stopped, those activities changed. Um, you asked the question of how it trickled down to the communities. Um, similar to the conservation efforts, a lot of the community empowerment efforts or the profit sharing efforts um, come through tourism. So that was obviously a big, a big deficit when the operations, the commercial operations ceased. Um, a couple of bright points though, uh, from Great Plains' perspective that we were happy to see was that our, our field monitors um, through Rhinos Without Borders in Botswana were deemed essential workers. So while the area was, was going through a lockdown and movements were being restricted, our wildlife monitoring teams were still able to continue their critical work, monitoring the animals, checking in on the areas, um, and really keeping those eyes and ears out there. And then similarly, we launched a project um, in response to all of this called uh, Project Ranger. And Project Ranger, its mission is at its, at its core to support the brave men and women on the front lines of conservation whose jobs and whose budgets have been adversely affected because of the downturn in, in the tourism economies. So through charitable giving, really focusing that spotlight on that um, and, and bringing that issue to light that these men and women um, many of the budgets are funded through tourism activities. So through Project Ranger, you can support them directly. Great. Um, ladies, anything to add to that? I mean, you know, I, I don't think- probably yeah, Go ahead, sorry. sorry. I was gonna say, I think I'd probably say, one thing that a lot of people um, that don't live here on the ground probably won't understand is also, the culture difference and the spread of information. So we had, I mean, if you think about lockdown happened sort of March and started to trickle through globally, a lot of our teams on the ground didn't really believe that this was real or that uh, there was, there was, you know, misinformation out there. And so there's a lot of people that don't have televisions or don't have radios. And so the information is, is more of a grapevine situation. And so we found quite a few challenges just with our, with, with our own teams. Um, and especially in some of the countries also that we were operating in, the governments, whilst they were conscious of what was happening, they didn't go into full on lockdowns. And so there was um, 
I wouldn't say resistance, there was just misunderstanding of what was actually happening and um, a question mark over, is this real? Are you telling us the full story? Do we really need to leave? Do we really need to not go to work? Do we really need to have our salaries hugely affected? Is this mm -hmm. happening? And it really wasn't until a few months had gone on. And I mean, in, um, in both of our countries, March is, is quite a quiet time. So there weren't huge amounts of guests anyway. Um, April, May, that's when things start to ramp up. And, uh, and when, they, when they didn't, everyone was like, wow, what's happened? And so that's probably a big thing that most people internationally won't understand is that there's a, a, a different communication system out here in terms of how the information gets to our teams. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Quite interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. So upon occasion, you know, when we're starting to design these incredible itineraries, you know, in Africa for our clients, we sometimes get asked, why are these safari camps so expensive? And the topic of cost is often a little bit taboo and maybe slightly uncomfortable, but I feel that the more that we're transparent about the experience and the more travelers understand that it's not just about the luxury of where they're staying, but rather how their travel experience as a whole actually supports so many critical and vital endeavors, I, I, I think that that's super important. And I'd love to hear more about the initiatives um, Anna, you know, started on that topic, but some of the initiatives that your organizations create and support and manage, um, you know, from anti-poaching to education to health and wellness, and of course, conservation, and how this global pandemic has really affected these programs. And maybe there's been some new or unique initiatives that you've had to create to cope. And, and maybe Mindy, you'd like to, to start with this one. Yeah. So if I can address that, that idea of why is it so expensive, you know, even in the trade, when I start to talk to people about, you know, if $100 is 100%, you know, if that's one bed night, and we know that it goes up to, you know, two, three thousand dollars these days. Um, there's so much money that gets taken out by government taxes and levies and just even the channel and before you've even, you know, paid a salary or bought a can of Coke. And to give you even a little bit more understanding of why things are so expensive, in Madagascar, for example, we've got 300% duties on wine. So don't even take the transport to get to the ends of the earth on an island, off an island, um, but you're also paying 300% on top of what the bottle costs at, at, at source. So that's just one tiny example. Um, Zambia, for example, the entire country, um, so I lived in Zambia for nine years and regularly every year we would run out of tonic. The whole country would run out of tonic water. And, you know, oh a my God, that's a tragedy. Such, <laughs> it's such an iconic <laughs> thing to have <laughs> on safari. And so, so for us, you know, there's so much logistics and forward planning that goes into, and we're also seasonal. So we only really make money for probably six months of the year, but we've got 12 months of fixed overheads and costs and salaries. So there's just a couple of things in terms of why things are so expensive that people, you know, don't understand. You're not in the business, you're not running it, you're not buying things. So um, that just gives one, one example. But we always say for people, by coming, they're already giving back. Um, the programs that we run, uh, the majority of our foundation team are women and they're Zambian and they're Madagascan. Um, and so these guys know what their communities need. And it's beautiful to see the way things develop and are implemented because they're made without sounding cheesy, kind of by the people, for the people. And I think that's the only way to run these sorts of um, programs in these sorts of environments. We, um, we started a new project called Project Oasis, which was funded by our own teams and by some of our past guests, which actually was helping our own staff in a time where we'd had to reduce salaries and you know some people's employment um, we ended up looking at food parcels and also seed money um, for them to create new ways of um, income generation through through this time so you know th there's a million things but that's just one quick one to sort of talk about yes. I mean, um, sorry Andrea what about yeah it's uh it's a, it's a really good question, and uh, Mindy's uh, described it really well, some of the reasons why it's deemed expensive. Um, when you're operating in remote areas, everything is more expensive. 
from the duties mm -hmm. to the logistics to getting specialists out to do what they need to do. Um, so yeah, but it, talking about kind of the, the community outreach and the environmental work that was happening during um, COVID, we, Sangeeta uh, focuses on three main things around community, which is early childhood development, um, environmental education, and then enterprise development. And we've pretty much stuck to that quite strongly and strategically, because we feel like if we specialize in three particular areas, we can do that really well, rather than trying to spread ourselves thinner. But this was an emergency situation during COVID. And so what we did with the, our South African um, community outreach um, the, uh, through the Singita Lofel Trust was to pivot against what we normally do and do emergency food parcels as well. But we didn't start from scratch. We actually used our existing suppliers who usually deliver food to the lodges. Uh, we used our existing early childhood development centers around our lodges as distribution points and the staff from those early childhood development centers as well as our own community staff to um, ascertain which families were most in need or not getting support by government. So it was this program that came in and got rolled out um, really quite quickly and in collaboration with other NGOs um, and community development people in the area. So I thought that was quite a good pivot for Singida to um, tackle in that, in that difficult time. And then the other quite nice story that came out of our Zimbabwe Lodge up in the Malangu Reserve is um, the, the staff found um, some people from the community had come into the reserve uh, illegally and they were fishing out of the dam. It's a beautiful Malangu dam in front of the lodge, which in normal times you would be pretty upset about this and, and probably try and uh, impose arrests because that technically is poaching. But this time they realized the community are, you know, it's really struggling um, and so they engaged with the fishermen instead, and they've started now a conversation around potentially setting up a fish farm um, outside the, the borders of the property. So just trying to think a little bit more empathetically and a, and a bit more kindly in this tough situation to try and, uh, yeah, to try and you know, do what you can to help. So I thought those were just two little interesting examples of, of you know, yeah. this tough time we're having. Anna? Yeah, I, I was taking notes as my panelists are talking because um, these are beautiful examples of, of how tourism can quickly pivot and to really recognize what it is that is needed most. And um, that was those are really beautiful examples. Um, things that I might add to it that our teams did um, as well. And this was really fun to see um, when mask making became something that was so front and center. Um, we literally had teams of our staff sitting at, um, you know, watching the tutorials on YouTube about how to make these simple masks and, and sewing masks out of um, fabrics from our camps or, or, you know, donated fabrics. So being able to go into the communities, these very remote communities. Um, Mindy, I love what you said about um, communication spread and how that is very different in, in rural areas and in these remote areas. And to be able to go into the communities with masks that, that our teams had made and talk with them about COVID and talk with them about the importance of wearing masks and, and distribution of those was, was really profound. Um, we had, when we did one, this was very early on in COVID and it comes back to Mindy's point. Um, we brought with us when, when we went out into the communities, um, a healthcare professional and, and literally sat down with groups and talked about this is what COVID is. You know, you're, you're seeing this information on Facebook, likely on Instagram, whatever the social, WhatsApp, whatever the social media platforms are. And this is, this is what it means, uh, you know, from a healthcare professional to share that. So um, those were a couple of little notes that I wrote down. The other one obviously was um, Project Ranger came about through this whole period. And, and it was, as I said earlier, acknowledging um, that a lot of conservation funding and, and anti-poaching wildlife monitoring uh, funds come through tourism. So, so setting up that program. It's amazing how, I mean, I think Pivot probably next to unprecedented and has become one of the most uh, <laughs> used words in 2020. Um, so sometimes when we talk about conservation as it relates to travel, people automatically think, oh, ecotourism. And how are these two different 
because they are very different. And how does an experience at a wonderful safari camp or lodge where one does not suffer from the lack of finer things support conservation? Um, maybe, uh, Anna, you can start with, uh, with, your, with this. Sure. And I think this um, really dovetails nicely into the conversation that, that we were having previously about cost. And when travelers and guests ask why, why do things cost what they do, um, I always think it's nice to pivot, again, to use the buzzword, to, <laughs> to pivot that conversation to talk about value. And that it's not, you know, let's not talk about cost, let's talk about value. And I think the discussion around ecotourism um, can, can be a part of that. Ecotourism, for whatever reason, has these connotations of roughing it and you know you may be envisioning some some very limited um kinds of uh accommodations maybe pit toilets you know these sorts of things and um you know that's not necessary when we talk about conservation tourism and you can be comfortable um, that's because Great Plains and I'm sure my colleagues here are the same have made investments in in power sourcing through through clean clean energy sources, I'm thinking specifically of you can have a cappuccino that from a cappuccino maker that plugs in because we have a solar field that's providing that electricity. So you know these kinds of creeps of comforts and and things that that make staying comfortable are possible, but the investments need to be made in some of these back end infrastructures that. You know, I'm very proud and and I love going on those back of house tours and seeing yeah, me too. They're extraordinary really? and they speak to that sustainability ethic that is front and center with ecotourism, but they allow for um, luxury experiences. So that's that's my perspective and I'd love to hear the others. Mindy, what how do you feel about conservation supporting ecotourism? Yeah, and I think again, it's all all the things that are almost um, hidden or taken for granted. You know, there's a ten times multiplier effect just on employment. The people that we employ have got dependents, or they've got uh, the the ability to start up a vegetable growing co-op in the village or a bicycle repair shop. And so there's so much that people have no idea. One person being employed by a lodge in a place that there is no other employment opportunities, just has this wonderful ripple or knock-on effect. When we built our lodge in Lua Plain in Zambia's, um, Zambia's west, some of the, the guys there uh, in, involved in the construction, for example, had never even seen a hammer or a, or a nail or a bolt, you know. And so there's also this, this really interest, and same with Madagascar, you know, we had 600 people involved in the construction that took us almost five years to build the lodge and or the resort. And um, the stone masonry that came out of these people that were, that were just locals that had no skills. And then you can imagine how, how many years it took to create all the stonework. By the end of it, they had a, an amazing skill. And so, you know, I'm just taking one aspect. There's so many that we can talk about, but just one aspect of employment and that multiplier and knock-on effect both with the dependents but also with the way that they create skills in an environment where there's literally nothing else except for um, unsustainable you know things like going out and getting firewood and and burning it to create fire to create food to you know so and then deforestation as one you know impact of not having tourism and yeah. I would just add to that in, in, in the, the huge benefit from employment of local communities. Um, and once communities see the benefit of tourism for their livelihoods and their families, there's much less incentive to, you know, go into wildlife areas and graze there or to um, be tempted into uh, poaching, whether that's for trade or for subsistence. Um, it provides an incredible um, economy in some of those really you know, outlying areas, um, and, and that is only beneficial for conservation. I, I agree. Um, so talking about maybe another slightly overused word, 
sustainability. It's sometimes a word that gets a little bit overused. We talk about not using plastic bags and single use plastic bottles. We all wanna do our part to recycle. I, personally, I'm a recycling fiend. Um, but being sustainable out in the African bush and for the long term has a much, much bigger meaning. Um, Andrea is the person in charge of sustainability on behalf of Singita. What does this mean from a big picture standpoint? Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, when I, I was studying for sustainability, I read a, a piece in a, in a paper once that said there's over 300 definitions of sustainability out there in the academic world. So let's not get hung up on the actual definition. Um, as you say, it can be an overused term. I mean, at Singita, we think about sustainability as working towards a world in which people are happy and healthy, very relevant for right now, but living within their fair share of resources, leaving space for wildlife and wilderness, because that is really our core mission. If we, if we can achieve that holistic vision, then we feel we're on the right track. And I would also say that you never reach a point of sustainability. It's an ongoing, contextually changing journey to try and move towards getting that, that great balance between the social and the environmental um, and economic, of course, um, aspects. Um, I mean, for Singita, it, it literally is going to determine our survival. Without sustainable behaviors around climate change, around biodiversity loss, around managing um, wilderness areas, we eventually will not have a product. We will, those, the wildlife will die out. Those areas will not you know, be visitable anymore. Um, climate change is going to wreak havoc with being able to travel at all. And so it is absolutely critical that not only us, but the, also that we inspire other industries to be sustainable. If, if us as ecotourism operations can't be sustainable, how can we expect other industries? So it is so critical to not only our brand promise as an ecotourism business, but to our, the ultimate survival of our product and the experience we can offer guests. So Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a big question and I, I do get quite worked up and passionate about it because I really believe it's, it's, gonna, it's the lifeblood of our business. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, Anna and Mindy, any, any points to add here? Um, I think that was beautifully articulated. Uh, and I would just add something we talk a lot about internally with us and I'm, I'm sure my fellow panelists talk about this is that distinction between consumptive versus non-consumptive use of the resources of the land, of our actions, um, and, and recognizing that we want to be in a position where it's non-consumptive, that we are giving back, that we're not depleting resources, that we are making them better. And um, you know, some of the very simple ways that we do that is by having small um, lodges, a, a small footprint that if if we have to pick up and go, or if, if there's a reason why things have to change, that the landscape will not forever be scarred by our presence there um, and just leading with that ethic. So. Yeah, and I, I'll probably just add one small thing. I think, Andrea, you're the expert. I'll leave that to you to, you to expand upon. Um, our, one of our founders, um, used to say, and this was going back, so uh, one of our businesses started in 1950, so, um, you know, a long, long time ago. And Norman Carr used to um, say, without giving the, the local people an economic benefit to what you're doing, they're never going to contribute to the um, conservation of your habitats and your wildlife. And I think it's, it is, it's this, we're starting to use kind of a terminology around impact web and things like that. And it, it as Andrea said, it is, how do all the spokes fit together between a guest and you know your local custodians of the land um, and the the company as well and, and the communities and um, and I know that the word is being bandied about a lot at the moment but I do think it's a good one and that's regeneration so rather than sustaining something as it is it's how do we leave it better and I suppose that's I mean if nothing else this year has kind of given us that pause maybe of of how do we how do we do better next rather than how do we just keep the status quo? Yeah, no, I, I think I we've like actually that. been thrown. Uh, I'm sorry. It's like, I know it's the silver lining in this huge crisis is that 
I think things are going to be accelerated along that path. And I think we'll all be happy about that because that's what we've been, you know, driving for, for the last few years or more. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I love that term conscious comeback. I, and I really believe, I believe that we need to look, look towards that and, and make that a goal, you know, not, you know, there's that, you know, when we used to get out of school, you know, it was time for summer break and there was that song and this is going to date me horribly, you know, school's out for summer. And it was like, ah, you know, I just hope that when we're all able to travel again, that we kind of like think about before we just make a mad rush, you know, when we do a little bit of a conscious comeback. Um, I love how all three of your organizations and your foundations have a key component. We've talked a lot about this, of supporting local communities. I mean, that's very important to me. And it's one of, one of the pillars of your travel designer. We, we give back every year and support um, our local communities. Um, so, and I had a firsthand chance to personally experience this um, in Kenya. Uh, with Great Plains and in Tanzania with Singida. Um, Mindy, I would love for us to learn more about the community projects that Time and Tide supports. Yeah, so we've been really lucky, as I said, um, you know, in Zambia, we've been going for around 70 years. So there's a lot of history there. We've got some beautiful stories of um, some, some of the kids that we sponsored through school and education are now um, part of our management, senior management team in the lodges. You know, there's this beautiful sort of cycle that, that goes through and then they become mentors for the next people that come through. Um, but I just wanted to talk about two, two things quickly, um, one in Zambia and then one in Madagascar as well. So our, the Time and Tide Foundation really has a number of focus areas like, like everyone does um, and ours are around people. So it's mainly female empowerment, it's education student sponsorships, and then it's also um, what we call our home-based uh, education program, which is about vulnerable and differently able children. And actually, that's what I want to talk about. It's, um, it's so emotive, and this, is, this has come right through the grassroots, and we do this in all three regions in Zambia, and also we're looking in, um, in Madagascar too. So we try and roll out all of our programs through the Time Tide Foundation across all four of our areas. Um, and what it is, is looking at, um, looking at kids that have got, so again, if we talk about these rural communities where children that are different um, are seen potentially as having witchcraft or it's, it's the cultural nuance there is huge. So they're sort of hidden away. And um, the first uh, time we, we sort of announced that we were going to look at these differently able children and a community of how we can care for them as part of the community, we had 300 people turn up, 300 women mainly turn up. So you're like, wow, how many kids out there with cerebral palsy or fetal um, alcohol syndrome, lots and lots of things that are relevant in that level um, that are, that are un, unheard. And, um, and so we've done some really beautiful things where we're getting um, caregivers from the community, we're working with them, we're training them, and these children that have no motor skills, that can't even hold their heads up, these young kids that never have a chance ever of going to school, all of a sudden with just the care of the community with people that have been trained in how to do it, even little simple things like body stress release um, uh, is enabling these children to be able to, and I know this sounds simple, but to grasp something, grasp a pen, grasp a fork, grasp a toy, um, and then you know develop those fine motor skills so that, that they can then possibly walk and start to improve their speech and then hopefully end up going to school. I mean, you talk about changing someone's life, there's big and you can change as many people as you can, but then changing that one little kid's life that otherwise had really no chance at much in the future is quite exceptional. And to see how that really, really um, is relevant and impact. I mean, it's just, it's really quite beautiful. It's hard to describe it. You know, you, you, it hits your heart when you're there. Um, and just really, really quickly in Madagascar, um, we don't do a lot of wildlife conservation ourselves. We sort of leave that to the, the organisations that we partner with and, and they're sort of the experts. But in Madagascar, there's not a lot out there. And so we've, um, we've undertaken a Lima translocation over the last 
probably four years. Mm. We've done two, and um, that's because the, the the group of lemurs. So lemurs are endemic to specific forests. They're only found in this specific area. There's a hundred different species across um, or subspecies across Madagascar, and in the area that we are, the, these crowned lemurs were being poached and being sold into the restaurant trade for the equivalent of a dollar fifty. So you know, Anna, you talked before about consumptive versus non-consumptive. You know that lemur is gone. It doesn't do anything. Um, you know, and it's heartbreaking. And uh, they ended up finding about 65 lemurs, which was pretty much the entire population from this forested area. And so um, it's it's a decades long project where you've got to work with the communities to get them to um, protect the habitat. We are then translocating the lemurs onto the island, uh, which is a bit of a sanctuary. You know, they can't then, um, you know, be be um, adversely affected there. And you're still working with the local communities to protect the existing species that are there. And then over time, we're hoping that um, if they procreate enough, we'll be able to move them back onto the mainland into a place where the local communities are protecting the habitat and we can then regenerate the populations on the mainland. Um, so, I mean, it's really intricate and, and complex, but it's, it's so beautiful to see it really, it, it can work. Yeah, I mean, and we could sit here and talk about all of your initiatives, I mean, for hours. I mean, I wish we were sitting around the campfire somewhere in Africa with a good glass of South African Pinotage <laughs> under an African sky. That would be, you know, the best way to be, to be doing it. Because between, you know, some of the amazing things that I've experienced with Singita and again with Great Plains Camps and uh, Mindy, I, I just really can't wait to, to be able to travel around and go to Madagascar and Zambia and, and really see firsthand. But what I'm so excited about is to be able to talk about the here and the now and the future because borders are reopening. Um, you know, over the past couple months, uh, Americans have been able to start to travel again to Kenya, Tan Tanzania, Madagascar, Zambia, and Rwanda. And just Monday, the borders reopened in Botswana. And last night at 11 p.m., I got an email that South Africa has reopened <laughs> its borders for Americans who were on the red list. So I just think that it's just really exciting and of course you know we're going to have to adhere to certain protocols as it relates to specific entry requirements which is great i think everybody's completely fine with that and hopefully zimbabwe will you know be able to reopen you know down the road but i'm sure that our clients are going to be very curious to you know learn about what the new face of travel is going to, to look like when they come and stay at your lodges and camps because, you know, safari is such a personalized experience. So maybe we can hear a little bit about what's changed, what can our guests expect, and how can we really ensure that this is a fantastic way to travel and be socially distant in a socially distanced environment, whether you know it's a, cu a couple coming to celebrate an anniversary or their honeymoon, or family traveling together, or a group of friends, you know, wanting to be in this this bubble. Um, uh, who wants who wants to take this and start? I'm going to throw it out, and you guys can fight over it. <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> Okay, I'll start. Um, so, I mean, there's some things that remain the same and, and those are the fact that a safari lodge in Africa is one of the best places to stay socially distanced and escape the crowds. Um, and there's abundant fresh air and sunshine and space. Um, and particularly, I mean, obviously the, the companies um, of my panelists as well as Singita um, uh, are just set for this kind of thing. It's, it's very personalized. Um, there are private villas where if a guest or a, a group of guests is particularly um, concerned or nervous, they can have a completely exclusive experience um, uh, at uh, Kataza House in Rwanda, at Serengeti House in Tanzania, at um, Castleton in South Africa in Sabi San, uh, where they will have the same guide and ranger, they will have the same staff, um, they can be completely separate from other guests if they wish to. 
Um, we've obviously put a, a huge amount of effort into making sure that uh, guests and staff and any other visitors to our property um, are safe and healthy. The protocols are, are strong. Um, it's very well planned out. So that, that will have changed. You know, there will be a few more, you'll, you, you'll be um, um, scanned, you know, as you come into any uh, the public area once a day or when you head off and game drive, just to keep everyone safe and happy. Um, so, so that will have changed, but really um, the, the pre-existing experience was amazing. What, what we've used this time to do though, while we were missing our guests so badly, is really sit back and think about what this indeed experience needs to look like after this, when the guests start coming back. And there's some key concepts that have come through and one of, and one of them I was super excited about and that was simplicity and sustainability. <laughs> so that's gonna get an even bigger boost now. Um, I think guests are gonna expect it even more. And then obviously sanctuary um, and the health and wellness and connectedness. So we're really gonna try and create as many places, experiences for people to connect, to connect with nature, connect with themselves, connect with um, our local staff as well. So there's a strong focus on that. And then a quest for knowledge and a promotion of the authentic African culture where in the places we're situated. So it's actually super exciting. We can't wait to roll it out and try it on the guests as they come back in um, because I think, they, I think they are gonna love it. Sign me up. Anna? Yeah, um, so I, I love what we were just talking about there and I, I wanna pick up on a thread which is this idea of restorative um, travel too, that for many guests coming from all over the world, um, you know, living in this world where there's been restrictive travel and, and you haven't been able to connect and disconnect from, from the news, from, you know, other, other work things, to be able to come at what I think is the world's, one of the original socially distant vacations available, and um, you know, really restore, restore yourself emotionally, mentally, um, your relationships to be able to have that time together um, in a beautiful place. I loved, I'll echo everything that was said before, open air, plenty of sunshine, just um, you know, those kinds of things. So in addition to the physical measures that were, were kind of uh, talked about, obviously mask wearing, temperature checks, um, and, and making sure that all, all staff who are interacting and, and then the availability to, to meet guests where they are um, in their own comfort levels. So if, if guests are concerned, are particularly concerned, to be able to acknowledge that and respond to it in a way that they can have an even more socially distant experience. But if guests are, are looking for, for more interaction, well then we can provide that in a way that is safe and keeps everyone safe. Mindy? I just echo what the two ladies have said. I totally agree with you. And I think Anna and Andrea, you're right. It's that, I think Africa has it naturally, that restore, that restoration. Um, it's the earth, uh, it's looking up and seeing a shooting star. And it's, it's the, the chance to take a breath. Like you've just got so much room to breathe. Um, I mean, <laughs> I always laugh. Our island, so we're the, the, the island's private. We're, the whole site's two kilometres and we've only got 14 villas. You know, you can't be more socially distant than that. So, um, and I think with all of us as well, you know, in time and tide, most of our camps are small. So all of our Zambian um, camps have got five or six rooms and that's it. So you, you're not amongst giant hotels and lots and lots of people. Um, and we only have you know, four people in a vehicle or four people on a walk. So you're, it's generally in your own space anyway. Africa, Africa is the perfect 2021 travel destination. So at your travel designer, you know, we have a lot of clients that are anywhere from fairly to super active. And I'd love for all of you to paint a clear picture that when Somebody comes to be on safari. It doesn't have to mean that you're in a safari vehicle for three to four hours a day, two times a day, and then you have this big chunk of time in the middle with nothing really to do other than lie around, which you know, to some people sounds great, but to some people is like being poked in the eye with a you know, dull stick. Because um, <laughs> I, I think that that's a big 
misconception and some people's biggest trepidation. I mean, personally, I've done walking safaris. I've done the coral paddling experiences. And last year, I even, you know, did this amazing horseback ride experience across the plains of, of Kenya. So I'd love to hear about some of the fabulous activities that one can do while on safari that clients might not be aware of. And Mindy, I'd love for you to start this because when I was, you know, doing a lot of research about time and tide and especially Zambia, because it's not a destination I've ever had a chance to travel to, I was blown away. I mean, you literally would not have to be in a safari vehicle if it isn't something that was interesting to you. So yeah, uh, absolutely. So it's the home of walking safaris. And actually Zambia was my first ever safari experience. I was living and working in London and went to Zambia for a friend's wedding and ended up kind of basically not leaving for <laughs> since then. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I loved is this idea of, of walking, you know, getting out onto the ground, um, smelling the earth, smelling the, the environment. I mean, even smelling the animals, you get, you, you get a different sense of it when you're, when you're out on foot. And also importantly, you feel like you're part of the ecosystem because it's, it's a little nerve wracking. You know, you're in an animal's environment, not your own, but uh, exactly the adrenaline. <laughs> I mean, safety obviously is of paramount importance and, and touch wood, um, you know, we, we've never had an incident um, to, to sort of worry about in terms of the walking and, and the guides are incredibly well trained um, and over a long period of time and in every single discipline. Um, so as the home of walking safaris, uh, we've been doing this for decades and it, I like the idea of getting up in the morning, you have your breakfast and then you actually, you don't transfer from camp to camp you walk from camp to camp and that's your safari experience. And it takes you four hours and you get to see lots of little things along the way that you don't see on a vehicle, you know, prints, tracks, scratch marks on trees, you know, trunk marks on trees, kills up a tree. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I don't know whether I can tell this story, but I remember um, on one walk, we had a beautiful herd of elephant not too far away from us. We had these zebra, um, sort of over the other side and then these little warthogs that kept coming sort of towards us and then and then going away and we're all sitting there just breathing in the moment <laughs> and then breaking the silence with this giant zebra fart <laughs> it was just <laughs> such a moment that I would never have expected to have on safari <laughs> um, it is nature <laughs> And, uh, but, but equally, you know, across Zambia, there's so much that you can do. You can canoe, you can fish, you can get in a boat, you can walk, as you say, you know, you wouldn't even need to get into a vehicle if you don't want to. And in Madagascar, we call them blue safaris over there. Um, you kind of like James Bond. It's like an adventure playground. You know, you can, you can do as much or as little as you want. And uh, there's, there's so many activities to do from, diving from lima trekking to um, getting on a, a wakeboard or going kite surfing or you know walking and, and looking at turtles nests on the beaches and watching turtles hat i mean there's just there's a plethora of things to do in madagascar and and yeah we definitely often say oh i feel like james bond <laughs> any really unique things um Andrea and Anna that you'd like to kind of tell our clients about? I mean, I know a few, but I don't, I'm not going to say. <laughs> I'll tell you all of them because we try and keep some of them as a surprise I for know, the guests when they're I there. <laughs> but um, what I'd like to bring into focus is maybe the gastronomic experiences that can happen at the lodges. So beyond just your standard set of meals, if you want to get involved in a cooking class, if you want to get involved with our community culinary school, which is at our um, Kruger National Park Lodge, you can go for lessons there with the students. Um, we can organize private cooking classes. We can organize cocktail making, private wine cellar and wine tastings. We have a, an amazing wine cellar. Um, so yeah, so there's definitely, if you're a foodie, there's plenty to do besides being in a, in a Land Rover. Um, and then, um, as Mindy was saying, plenty of uh, opportunity to walk in the bush, learn about tracking animals, um, learn some basic birding skills, visit our canine poaching, anti-poaching unit, 
Um, that's always wonderful for the dog lovers. Um, and, and obviously guided, guided hikes. Um, and then if you're really up for a challenge in our at Wilson Barbie Lodge, you can do CrossFit training with our anti-poaching scouts. And those guys are serious. So yeah. if, if you are one exactly of those really super good. fit people, this is a yeah. nice challenge to take on. <laughs> and, uh, I love that idea of working out with the, um, <laughs> That's amazing. If you want to see they some are amazing fit, fit people, fits. right? <laughs> That's incredible. Um, so I, yeah, I'll just add a couple of other ideas. I love that you mentioned the horseback riding. I think that is something that um, when I've had the opportunity to do that, um, especially in Kenya, it is spectacular. It is. I did that at Old Donyo, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. good. Oh, yeah. good. Um, you know, there are these moments where I think a friend described it best, where you're riding among a herd of other animals and you're on horseback and you kind of look to your left and you look to your right and you think, oh my gosh, we're all on the same. <laughs> you know? We're now part of this herd in a way. Yeah, it's so amazing. So the horse is absolutely, if, if people have an interest or a desire, and, and that's something that really any kind of level of equestrian experience, um, you know, we can, we can adjust. So it doesn't have to be something of expertise. Helicopters are also an amazing way, especially in Botswana. Botswana, so fabulous. It's spectacular. If, if you have the opportunity and the interest, um, a helicopter tour is, spec it's a spectacular way to see the Delta. Um, and especially as you're flying over some of the, the different waterways and you're seeing the hippo and the crocs and, and all of this life in the water, it's such a different perspective. It's, it's beautiful. Um, and then just the last part that I'd add would be the opportunity to visit some of the community projects. And those are typically opportunities that we do in during the day, obviously, um, rather than evening activities, but an opportunity to go and, and meet with the community liaisons or um, visit one of the women's craft groups. You know, those kinds of things, you really do make a personal connection. It, it shares um, an intimate look of what the communities are like surrounding these areas. So, and so special and they just leave such a lasting um, impression for sure. Um, all right. So, um, lastly, have there been any specific stories or aha moments that have come out of this situation that have been personally um, inspiring that you'd like to share? I mean, I believe that necessity is the mother of invention, and I love hearing what people have created or invented during this time of pause that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise because you know, we've always been so busy. And personally, I love to find the silver linings. So um, maybe Andrea, you'd like to start with this one. Sure, thanks, Jolene. Um, for me, my aha moment, I was really struck by how creative companies got in this time. Um, really, uh, the silver lining for me was the, the time for us to really think about what we wanted to do going forward and the incredible creativity that came out um, during that process. And there were lots of cross departmental and cross lodge teams working on these various concepts. So that's brought us as a Singita group closer together, um, definitely. Um, I think also the realization that nature really is a healer. And we saw that through the success or, or the popularity rather of our live safari drives, which we started, which we'd never done before. I we thought, yes, we just <laughs> want to be on in the real thing. But we, we, we started doing them in the Sabi sand twice a day. There were people who were reorganizing their office meetings so that they could go on that live safari. We had upwards of hundreds of people on a virtual safari with only one game viewer. So that for us really um, told us the impact that what we do and, and that we can even do it virtually and reach out and bring people a bit of nature and a bit of healing and a bit of solace in a tough time. Just so, so that, that was the, the big like, wow, that we've experienced during this time. Uh, Mindy. I think, um, probably not having any guests made 
our teams and me watching like the team's reactions, you realize they just love what they do. And we were talking earlier about communication and lack of in some of these rural areas and this whole bush telegraph. For a lot of our guys and girls, meeting these international guests is the way that they learn about the world. And it's such a beautiful thing for them to open their eyes and, and hear and learn about, you know, whether it's Australia or whether it's Canada or whether it's Germany, you know, they're all different. And the, the morale um, that was really delicate, the balance without the guests there and how, you know, um, just how important, like, there's not a lot of people that love what they do. I mean, we've got some of our guides that are 20, 30 years into guiding, and they sometimes come back more excited than the guests. And so for me, it was just, you know. You know. I love that when you're on a safari and your guide is as ex excited, if not more, about what you're seeing. It's just so special. And that, that was a big aha moment for me is the fact that we've got, we're really, you know, we talk about our company being a little family and, you know, to watch your family be struck down by the fact that they can't do what they love doing and, and then to see it start to come back again and to see almost this rejuvenation, but how quickly, it, it, you know, people get back into it and they're like so excited. So that, that was a really nice aha moment for me. And Anna? Yeah, um, I think one of the aha moments that I've, I've certainly experienced was in me talking with others and, and being able to share with them just the huge role beyond a vacation that tourism plays in all of these areas where we're operating and working and that it is not just um, a frivolous industry. It's one that really is a pillar of, of entire countries GDP and and certainly of the regional economies and where we work mm -hmm. and that moment so a, allowing to see that aha moment in others um, has been really meaningful for me and and been able to to talk and take conversations about tourism and, and conservation um, in into a new level so yeah all point so we do have a few questions that came in while we were talking away and um, we have a few minutes so I'd like to get to them. Um, one was, can you talk a little bit more about back of house tours? Is that something we might see and get to understand better when staying with you? I love back of house tours. So, um, and I think probably we could always organize something like that as part of an itinerary when we know that that's something of interest. I mean, I, I think that almost every time I've gone in, on safari and stayed somewhere, I've been able to go and either do a back of house tour of um, the solar plant or a kitchen or something like that. And, and I think when your staff know that we have guests, that are interested in that it's it makes them so happy oh, um, i'll kick off there one of my ambitions when i started doing sustainability with singita was to have a back of house as amazing as a front of house from a sustainability point of view so if a guest wanted to see energy water waste systems that i would have no qualms with showing them around back of house um, one of the interesting things is we a lot of our kitchens are now open to front of house so that's that's been a, a bit of a trend to bring a bit of back of house front of house definitely people want to see what's happening in the kitchen um and as you mentioned the solar tour um, at our la bombo sweeney lodges um we have a, an amazing um, solar battery hybrid plant and at one stage our technical manager was taking three visits a week of guests who were really interested in, in finding out about that system yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the solar plants. Even the recycling, as a recycling fiend, I'm always like, like, how does the recycling work here? And the things that come from recycling in the bush are, are really amazing. Um, that somebody says, it's wonderful news about the wildlife workers. I had no idea they were deemed essential. Are there ways to contribute 
if we're not ready to travel, i.e. donations. So I, I just wanna say that one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna definitely send links out, um, not just to Singita and Great Plains Conservation and Time and Tide, but we'll make sure that we include the link to links to all the foundations because this is the way to really support the endeavors um, that we've all been talking about um, here. Um, okay, this is probably a hard question. For each of you, if you had to pick a favorite thing about your company, what would it be? It could be a property, an experience, a program, et cetera. Ooh, it's like picking a, saying your favorite child. <laughs> I, so I'm happy to say, as you were um, asking the question, the first thing that came to mind was the people. Oh. Um, and that is absolutely what is inspiring. I loved um, hearing earlier about the aha moment being watching the creativity and resilience of colleagues, um, whatever the role, whatever the region that they're working in. Um, it's absolutely inspiring. It is wonderful to see their commitment and, and, their, and the love of their job. I mean, my goodness, you know, how fortunate are we to, to work in an area where people love doing what they do? So the people. I mean, you know, there's that adage, you go to Africa once and you kind of, it stays with you forever and you are constantly trying to find a way to, to return. And for me, you know, I always wanted to go, I'm an animal lover and I always, my dream was to go to experience the wildlife. But once I, met, I went, it was the people that made, made me want to go back. Anyways, not to get emotional, but thank you all so, so much. This has meant the world to me for your support and um, of something that's very, very important. And I can't wait to have that glass of South African wine with all of you one day, hopefully in the near future, whether it's in New York or in Africa, um, and travel around with all of you in the future. So thanks again, and here's to 2021. Thanks so much. Bye. All right, thanks, 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 ladies. Have a great weekend. It was a great conversation. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thanks, thanks so lady. much. All right, cheers. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs>